Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this, what I call, happy hour of our project. I'm Christine Davis, Vice Chair of Urban Confluence Silicon Valley. As a longtime resident and business owner of downtown San Jose, I'm excited to have this great honor to serve my community for this historic project, and it truly is historic. Tonight is our third of at least six community meetings since the three finalists presented their impressive and refined designs to the jury on January 30th. I hope you've all had time to watch those inspiring presentations. I'd like to say that from inception, just like tonight, that these community meetings have been one of our most important outreach efforts in making this a successful project for our community. Our goal tonight is to give you great information and do it in an efficient manner because we're very respectful of your, respectful, excuse me, of your time tonight. Our protocol is we are recording this meeting we will not be using the chat function. We will be using the Q&A. That's what will be used for your questions. So please submit them to the Q&A of the uh, Zoom. I'd like to start by introducing two very important relationships to urban confluence. And we've asked them to speak uh, briefly. One is Jason Sue, who is the executive director of Guadalupe River Park Conservancy. And directly following Jason, I haven't seen that he's on yet or not, but if he is, directly following Jason is Jody Starbird. Jody is the past president of Guadalupe River Park Conservancy. She's been on board with our project since inception as well. And she also serves as one of our jurors. So thank you both for uh, being here tonight. And I'd like to turn it over to Jason right now, followed by Jody if he's on. Great, thank you, Christine. Uh, and thank you, Steve. Good evening, everyone. Again, my name is Jason Sue. I'm the Executive Director of the Guadalupe Root Park Conservancy. Uh, very excited to be here and to see the presentations, to learn more, and to really just see the amount of community support and interest in this very exciting initiative. The River Park itself is a very exciting and dynamic place right now in the middle of expansive growth and a lot of changes within our city and initiatives like these that really help spark inspiration for how we envision our future and our quality of life and our engagement with our city and our spaces is something that we look forward to. And so thank you all for the opportunity to speak. Thank you all who are viewing the, uh, for your time this evening. And I look forward to future discussions around this project. So thank you. And I'll turn it over to Jody. Thanks, Jason. Uh, we are the Guadalupe River Park Conservancy. We are the city's nonprofit partner in the activation and development of the Guadalupe River Park. Arena Green, the proposed location for the project, um, is one of the downtown parks that's within our sphere of influence. Um, it's uh, seen better days and we welcome a new invigoration into the area. And so we have been, as Christine said, a stakeholder from the very beginning in the process. Um, and this group uh, has been working very hard to be sure that a lot of stakeholders have been involved, including the city of San Jose. They've been a very important stakeholder as we, we've all moved forward and we've benefited from their advice and their counsel. And we can imagine that to um, continue. So tonight, we just really fervently believe that the public input process is very important for this project. And so we have um, been encouraging the urban confluence folks as well as the other stakeholders to embark on this public engagement uh, process. And I can tell you as a juror, um, I and, and all of the jurists are very interested in your comments and your input. Um, into the process and the project. So we thank you again for your partic participation tonight and uh, we'll kick it off from here. Thanks, Jody. Thanks, Jason. You can see it's really a community effort here. Uh, I'd also like to take the opportunity to acknowledge John Ball, who is one of our founding board members of the San Jose Light Tower Corporation, which is now Urban Confluence Silicon Valley. 
He's the board chair of Urban Confluence, and John is also a juror. John is not on the call tonight with us this evening, but I just want to mention that he and his wife, Paula, they continue to lead by example in this community in so many ways for this project. And so thank you, Paula. Thank you, John. And moving forward quickly, I want to get on to turn the page and turn the program over to Steve Borkenhagen. He's our executive director of Urban Confluence and also a founding board member. But more so, I like to call Steve our walking encyclopedia of this project, and you'll know why as he leads us through this PowerPoint. Steve? Thanks, Christine. I appreciate that. <laughs> Uh, and I want to actually just talk for a moment about Jason and Jody and the Conservancy and also the City Department of Parks and Recreation. Uh, Nicole Burnham often joins us on these calls, but she couldn't make it tonight. She had another meeting. But without the Conservancy and Parks and Recreation, we couldn't do anything. The Conservancy is the, the steward organization of the park, and clearly the city owns the park. So we're grateful for working with Jody, Jason, their board, and uh, literally hundreds of community members who uh, help us uh, on, a, on a constant basis. <clears throat> I'll also point out that any Q&A that you, that you type in uh, will be shared with the jury. Uh, Jody talked about how important it is for uh, having transparency and good communication, and we are doing our best to do that. So if you have Q, any questions or comments, please put them into Q&A. And if you forget during this meeting, there's a comments button on the website, and all of those comments will be shared with the jury. So thank you again. So what are we trying to do? Uh, you know, our mission is to build uh, an artistically inspired structure. It's uh, some, somewhat architecture, it's somewhat art, it's all different things depending on what we end up building. We clearly have always wanted to build a landmark. We wanna build something iconic to our community and we want it to be a world-class destination that isn't just a place uh, we would all go to have lunch or in the evening to enjoy the beautiful lights, but also that people would travel to come to and that tourists from all over the world would, would see when they come here. Uh, sometimes we like to call it the future logo of Silicon Valley. I think if we get it right, our, our project will be like the Space Needle or like the St. Louis Arches for those communities, instantly recognizable and connected to a place. Some people commented when COVID came around that we should stop and give up our project. Uh, we thought about it long and hard, but we decided to continue. Uh, at, COVID's going to be over at some point. We're gonna be back to our normal lives and to build something like we are we're building uh, takes many years. Uh, we'll probably be at seven or eight years by the time that, that we're done. So we really believe we made the right choice that public spaces and parks matter now more than ever. And that when COVID is over, we're all gonna be desperate to get out and be with one another uh, like, like we've always been. Uh, humans are social animals. We, we crave being outdoors, and it, it's largely why parks are such important assets of communities everywhere. And also parks are like, are like libraries and schools. They're uh, democratizers. They're things that equalize benefits for the community. Everyone will be able to go to the park or, or look at our project when it's complete. An important reminder, we are giving this as a gift to the city. The city will not be paying for it. We will be raising the money privately building this and giving it as a gift to the city. Of course, the city council and the mayor will be involved multiple times in giving approvals. Uh, ultimately, if they don't approve, uh, we can't move forward. But the, the way we try to ensure that they will agree is that we're, we are working constantly with the Conservancy Parks Department and other executives, including the city manager, to make sure that we're moving forward in a respectful way of all city processes. Finally, we, we see this as a, as a must-see place that in the future when people come to our area, they'll have to go there, that the people at the airport or anybody they know will say, have you been to Urban Confluence? Uh, and, uh, and people will come. By the way, the, the name will almost certainly change to a name that's appropriate for the winning design. I'm not gonna go through all of these design evaluation criteria, but they do appear on the website. And the point is that there are very strict criteria that were given to the jury in selecting the finalists and ultimately in selecting the winner. So our site is Arena Green at Guadalupe River Park and Gardens, which as you can see in the photo is between Highway 87 and SAP Center, that's east and west, and then 
to the south is Santa Clara Street and to the north is St. John Street. And it's part of the larger Guadalupe River Park, which goes on for uh, a couple of miles throughout the downtown. We did a very in-depth site selection study that was performed for us by Steinberg Hart. And this site was clearly superior to all the other sites, sites studied. And we studied every possible big site uh, in downtown San Jose. Our, our mission was always that we were gonna get, going to do this in downtown San Jose. And we're really happy Arena Green emerged because we, we firmly believe it's the best site. It's approximately 14 acres. Of those 14 acres, approximately five acres are buildable. If you look in the center of this slide, you'll see the pie-shaped uh, slice of, of, uh, of pie-shaped uh, triangle near the front. That's Confluence Point, which is not buildable. And uh, the acreage that is, is on the, on the two edges, on the right and the left. Without our donors, we would have nothing. Uh, we have uh, almost 400 donors. Uh, they go from a couple of hundred thousand dollars down to five dollars. We appreciate every last one of them. Uh, anyone who can give us their hard-earned money, we appreciate very much. And uh, of course, any of you who want to donate, we're, we're always grateful. If you have any questions, you're welcome to call me. Without constant stakeholder work, uh, again, we would not be where we are today. We've raised approximately two and a half million dollars to date. We've been to city council twice. We will be going again in May. Uh, the, the, I'll get into the schedule in a couple of minutes, but other partner organizations include uh, the county, Little Italy, Spur, uh, the Sharks are our next door neighbors and we meet with them often and we hope to be working together with them forever. Uh, Valley Water controls the river and the creek. They're an extremely important stakeholder. Uh, Knight Foundation has been generous to us. Uh, Spur has done a, a lot of good work in the park and uh, we've been working with them for years. Uh, Joint Venture has been helpful to us, the Downtown Association, and certainly the Downtown Residents Association. Uh, people who live in and around downtown, I would say almost uh, without fail, are really excited about what we're doing. Also, we have a large group of about 150 uh, emerging leaders and advisory council, and these are people whom we lean on uh, every day for advice about many, many different topics. Also, we had a really first-rate community competition panel of 33 people, and they, they analyzed uh, all of the almost 1,000 submissions and then recommended 47 to the jury for consideration. We have a first-rate jury of 14 people. Uh, in, in the upper left-hand corner, you see Jody Starberg, who was on the call earlier. In the lower right-hand corner, you can see John Ball. Um, and near the center of the top row is John Cicerelli, who is the head of Parks and Recreation. So John's been a really great partner to us also. And the rest are uh, local and national and international experts in their fields, uh, from environmental concerns to architecture to art to uh, public placemaking. We're really grateful to them. They've done a great job so far, and they will be meeting on March 6th to rank the three finalists. And then those three, that those rankings will go to the city council on May 4th. And we hope that we'll get unanimous approval from the city council for the, the rankings that we come up with and that they will agree with the ranking of number one and that that will become the winner of the competition. Some people say we had the most successful ideas competition in the world in uh, 2020, we'd like to think so. It's hard to, to measure one against another, but we had uh, 963 qualified submissions from 72 countries on six continents. Uh, somehow Antarctica didn't weigh in, and uh, I guess shame on me for not calling it Antarctica, but uh, we were really happy with the variety of people and the fact that 72 countries were recommended from, uh, of course, all, all, all over the world. An important point to remember is that the submissions were anonymous. The jury members, in fact, no one except a, a couple of people on our team knew the identity of any of the submitters. And that was done intentionally so that there was an even playing field for everyone who submitted. We were somewhat inspired by the Vietnam War Memorial and Maya Lin's amazing story when she was just a, a woman in college and uh, ended up winning that. And sure enough, two of our three finalists are very young people just out of school. Uh, and you'll see them a little bit later in the presentation. So the three finalists, one was born in Japan, one in China and one in Spain. And just a reminder how important public spaces are to life. Uh, all, all of us 
especially in the time of COVID when we're staying indoors all the time, I think are just clamoring to get outdoors to beautiful public spaces. And when you think about your travels around the world to Paris or New York or other places, you think about those beautiful outdoor spaces. They are really the key to urban life. So we have six phases to our competition. We're right near the end of phase two right now. So after the city council considers the, <clears throat> excuse me, the three finalists, <clears throat> on May 4th, then we'll go into phase three, which will be design development. Very quickly, we'll have schematics uh, developed, and then we'll be choosing contractors, and then there'll be a phase for permits and partnerships, as any project would have, uh, and a very, very large capital campaign. And then we'll be into construction and finally into operations and maintenance. So our vision is to give this gift to the city, as I mentioned earlier, but a reminder to all of you, especially San Jose citizens, is that the park will always be a park. We will simply give this as a gift. The park will, will and the city will own the gift and uh, how it will be operated exactly is yet to be determined. Once we have a winning selection, then we'll in earnest begin talking to the city about how that management's going to work and what organization will actually manage it, whether it's the Conservancy, the Parks Department or someone else. You'll see one of my bullets says it will not impact spending on public services, including feeding the hungry and housing the homeless. Sometimes the, the attitude toward art and culture is, uh, you know, why would you do that when we have people struggling? Well, what I'll say is that people are always struggling. They will struggle. They have struggled. And, and really, for the most part, I think the same philanthropists who support our project are people who are the most generous toward, toward the hungry and the homeless. Uh, I can certainly say that about the people on our team and that we need to do both of those things as a society, that is both nourish the soul through the arts and also take care of basic needs. And, and uh, we certainly believe that with, with all of our hearts. Our timing, I think, ended up being fabulous in that the Google Downtown West project will hopefully be approved in uh, May of this year. We're right across the street from that, that large project. Uh, Deardon Station and BART are proceeding. The, there will be a BART station essentially at Arena Green when it's done. Uh, that'll be a, the largest multimodal transportation hub uh, in the Western United States. Uh, Jay Paul, Adobe uh, are building very large projects along with uh, Gary Dillabo's group and a number of other developers, um, most of whom are friends of ours. And we, we, uh, we're really grateful for all of their support. And the Sharks are always doing exciting things next door. So I think we are really benefiting from the fact that this is a unique moment in the history of our city with a massive development, something in the neighborhood of of five or $10 billion within just a few blocks of our project. A number of the questions we got at the first two community meetings dealt with what's on this slide. So uh, we are fully committed to protecting the riparian corridor and all of the flora and fauna. Uh, ours will be a net zero project. Uh, security, safety, and ADA compliance will be front and center like they, like they really need to be for, for anything that's built nowadays. Uh, there, there will be elevators. The park isn't fully master planned yet, but that's going to flow out of the winning design. And again, we'll be working with our partners at the city and the Conservancy and others around park activation and also uh, master planning that uh, more details at the arena green part of the park. I don't mean the entire Guadalupe River Park. We believe there's indoor and outdoor potential and also daytime and nighttime potential. So as soon as we have a winner, we will begin to to carefully design all of the elements that will create a, both a daytime and a nighttime uh, exciting experience at the park. We're, we're uh, really inspired by having a wonderful park experience. Operations and maintenance will be taken extremely seriously, but we don't have a plan yet because we don't have a winner, but we will be working on that. And that would include cleaning, operations, maintenance, repairs, et cetera. The children's carousel status is still up in the air. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about moving it next to the play garden, slightly farther north in the Guadalupe River Park. We, we are not in control of that. Uh, it could be that the carousel say, stays and will be cleaned up and operated, or it could be that it's going to move. We, we really don't know that yet. Also, people constantly ask us about, about the homeless problem, both at our park and also throughout uh, San Jose and California, clearly we cannot fix the homeless problem uh, by ourselves and, and help the, the uh, 
poor homeless people who exist, but we'll, you know, we certainly try and do our part, but that, pro that problem is much bigger than us. So we hope we can be an important part of the solution along with all of the people who work full-time or part-time on that problem. So with that, uh, Mike Hubert, whom I'll introduce, Mike's our technical expert who uh, helps us with, with all things digital and we're very grateful for all Mike's work. And so Mike is now going to show a video with the three finalists.
Welcome to Wonderland is a realization of surreal literature. The experience transports you into a fictional character that challenges your cognitive ability. Silicon Valley has long been known for pushing boundaries in technology. The Welcome to Wonderland team is incredibly special. Companies that make up our team have experience designing and building complex and iconic structures around the globe. The multi-scale flora is packed into a huge figurative imaginary box measuring 100 feet wide by 225 feet long and 200 feet high. The structural system of Wonderland is a fusion of traditional framing integrated with an organically geometric composition of support for the gigantic flora. The entire biome of Wonderland is anchored to the earth at the central elevator and stair tower through a structural steel braced frame system. We have analyzed the constructability of the piece and have proved out the elements required to execute this immersive experience. Wonderland pushes the envelope of structural creations. A number of materials will be used to fabricate the various flora. The materials will deliver slightly varied textures, especially in close proximity to the sculpture. Materials used at grade and within patron spaces will have softer edging conditions. Our team has looked at every aspect of the project, from meeting building codes to stair towers and structural systems. So it is safe and secure. We have explored multiple material finish options and confirmed longevity and maintainability. We envision Riche as a caretaker of not only the opening day experience for the people of San Jose, but the ongoing experiences of the many generations to come. The experience is the intertwining between two different worlds. The juxtaposition of artificial nature against real nature allows you to dream or rethink the, the familiar world in a fantastic new way. An organic structural frame springs from the traditional framing to emulate the stems, sepals, and styles of the flora. The biomimicry provides for a seamless integration of the structural system with the artistic vision. The three components of the structural system, the braced frame core, the floor and ramp framing, and the organic flora structural support system are tied together as a unified whole to resist the environmental and seismic forces that Wonderland will need to resist. Wonderland entices and invites you to explore. Like Alice, you become curiouser and curiouser. In the novel, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, Alice says, being so many different sizes in a day is very confusing. As you move deeper inside, the oversized flower imparts a feeling that you are physically growing smaller with every step you take. The flora relates to each other by touching, leaning, and intertwining to produce a multitude of spatial qualities and experiences. Our project protects the repairing corridor and meets the goal of net zero. Our approach to net zero starts by sustainable design. We want to get to zero by first looking at conservation and efficiency before reviewing on-site renewables and purchasing renewable energy credits and carbon offsets. While this project shows its innovity in stillness during the daytime, it transforms its artificial nature into a vibrant, colorful bouquet at night. Projection brings the biome to life via digital canvas of over 55 million pixels across the east side of the sculpture. Images of creatures, animated textures, and visual effects combined with localized audio will surprise and excite guests. Projection mapping on the exterior brings the flora to life with dynamic colors and textures. As the sun sets, Welcome to Wonderland awakens a world of color. The bottom of the sculpture gradually illuminates, reaching upwards until it's entirely engulfed in color. 
on the interior, larger than like hologram creatures, allows you to experience an enjoyable and yet slightly unsettling environment. Welcome to Wonderland is poised to become a global icon, and the nighttime lighting experience will not only rival the lighting of icons around the world, but may also inform how they might look in the 21st century and beyond. Once you've been to Wonderland, you will always remember the sensation of being in a magical world. Returning to your ordinary world will never be the same. Welcome to Wonderland is a local landmark, but sets the stage to become a worldwide sensation. When we think about a contemporary landmark, we are envisioning something that connects the future and the past, something that recalls our emotion of the places and represents the identity of the city. A nebula is a massive cloud of dust and gas between stars acting as a nursery for new stars. What we need today for a city is not a monolithic monument, but something we can engage, something soft, ever-changing, and adaptable. As a great historical icon, the old San Jose Light Tower rendered the visionary courage of the pioneers of the city. Although the city is depicted as a technical vision hub today, we would like to remind people that our city is built and evolved from generation to generation. Here, the traditional characteristic of a light tower as a figure is inverted into a spatial void. How we behold it becomes more nebulous. It's like your memories. They may look ambiguous, they may fade away, but they will unfold at a certain moment. Our hope for the Nebula Tower is to bring time and light together and to create a hybrid prototype of diversity. It's an inverted tower and an arched gate. It's an arena for civic space and an observatory for the city. It's a structured vessel for lighting and a canvas for all artists. Our collective memory and our imagination are the bridges of our innovative spirit and our city. And those are what enable us to transcend the time and explore things beyond the boundaries. Christine, are you ready to move forward with the Q&A? I am. Excellent. So I would ask everyone to send us Q&A. I'm only seeing a couple of comments and no questions. We appreciate questions. And Christine, did you want to fill anything in before I talk about a few other things? Well, I just want to say every time that I see those videos, I have different emotions and they're all good emotions. Um, but as the evolution of this project has gone from um, the San Jose Light Tower to these three very inspiring and different um, designs, something you said earlier, Steve, 
is about spectacular public spaces are what's the heart of the communities around the world. And we are not trying to necessarily be in competition with the other icons, but in Silicon Valley, we're developing what we represent. And that's evolving. And to me, it has three major points. And that is, you know, the transformation, the transformation of this valley, the transformation of San Jose, the transformation of downtown San Jose. And we have a lot of uh, people and uh, businesses and, and many, many people to thank for that. Within that, I think that it's important for everyone here tonight to understand that a big portion of our, our mission here is to provide an area, a space, that public space that has inclusivity. It also has connectivity because we all need to connect to something. We need a place to go. We need a place to be proud of. And uh, a couple of the comments that sometimes as I listen to those presentations over and over is in, in in Silicon Valley, it's innovation and we go beyond the boundaries. And so certainly whichever one of these designs wins, we will go beyond the boundaries for our, our community. So I invite many of you to start sending us your questions. And uh, again, our walk-in encyclopedia and myself will do our best to answer those. Thank you, Christine. Um, a few questions are coming in, thank you. Um, First one is a little bit long, but I'd like to read it because I think it's important. It's great to see such energy and San Jose pride being summoned to a common goal. When visiting the site, I worry the location and opulence of this symbol might further highlight the, the disparities visible to anyone who walks or bicycles here. If a visitor feels the contrast between a hundred million dollar plus architectural tribute to tech and the many residents who have lost housing partly as a consequence of that success, it may actually detract from the mission. As part of the project's success, is it at all possible for the San Jose Light Tower Corporation, <clears throat> excuse me, staff and donors to couple this generous gift with a commitment from the city council to arrange shelter for the many homeless residents along the river corridor, especially those directly displaced by this project? I understand proposals to accomplish this will be brought before the city council this year by Reagan Henninger, deputy director of the San Jose Housing Department and could benefit from San Jose Light Tower Corporation's support. There's a lot in there, but uh, let me just take a couple of them. First off, I wanna be clear that our project is not a tribute to tech. Our project is just a beautiful work of art and architecture relevant to San Jose and to the site. So while Clearly, much of the wealth in our community came from tech. We are, we are not doing a homage to tech. That's not what our project is. Uh, as far as the juxtaposition of a beautiful object uh, with homeless people who are struggling, uh, I'm sympathetic to that. But as I said earlier, we, uh, I, I would venture to guess virtually every donor we have is also supporting services for the homeless. And we don't think it's either or, we think it's both and, and that we as a community need to both take care of our vulnerable citizens, but we also need to build beautiful things. Uh, and the, as Christine said, having the project accessible to everyone uh, is a huge part of our mission. Next question is, can we the public vote on a final or is this out of our hands? There will not be a formal vote of the public, but the way that you can have input and in essence vote is by asking questions just like you're asking here and going on our website and making comments. All of those comments and questions will be shared with the jury and ultimately shared with the city council. So they will hear everything that you all have to say. Another question is, your, as your part of the solution, would you consider including adoption by the city of such a plan as a condition for providing this gift. Given the renewed focus on equity in the planning and architecture, architecture communities, this could also provide an opportunity to build a monument to San Jose's compassion in addition to celebrating technology and engineering. So this is going back to this idea of the relationship between homeless uh, solutions and homeless services in building our landmark. And um, I haven't thought about a formal linkage like that so uh, if the questioner has uh, more specific suggestions, please pick up the phone and call me. We will take all of your 
your comments very seriously. The next one here is, is there an opportunity to comment rather than question? Absolutely so. Um, we, as Steve said, we invite the way that this project is going to, um, in a very successful manner, move forward is by public opinion. And uh, there's opportunity on our website. You can do it right here. It doesn't have to be a question because we're recording and, and taking all of these questions and comments down. And then we will um, either answer them ourselves or pass them on to one of the three teams, if it's specifically to one of the uh, three mm -hmm. lines, and answer those questions. So please give us your comments because that's going to be really important and all of those will be taken and given to the jury. Thank you, Christine. Uh, which design uses the least amount of energy for the lighting effects? Uh, I can't remember the specific energy use, but what I will say is that all three uh, of the finalists and whatever we build will be net zero. So we will be um, creating electricity on site through various means that will be adequate to power the entire project and ultimately the entire park. I'm excited about this, but have some concerns. The Alice design seems like it could be more distracting to cars on the nearby highway. Is that a consideration that you'd be making? Also, would you would you be making it clear that there would be no commercial material, pro, excuse me, there would be no commercial material projected onto the surfaces? Uh, the first question about Welcome to Wonderland being di a distraction to cars on the highway, uh, that's something that will be considered. Uh, it's been mentioned before and uh, all three of the designs will have to uh, deal with uh, distraction and uh, riparian corridor, bird safe design and everything to do with flora and fauna. As far as the second question about, uh, would we make it clear there will be no commercial material pro projected onto the surfaces? Uh, that's going to happen in phase three. I, we can't even answer that yet. And that would clearly be something that the city council would ultimately decide. So I, I don't know the answer to that. And really, no one knows the answer to that yet. Christine, you want to take a couple questions? Yeah, uh, I, I really appreciate these are spectacular, very emotional and moving presentations. Very excited. Thank you very much. We need uh, to know that. The second one is where will the public restrooms be placed within proximity of each design? Each design has done a good job if uh, you know, we've given you this evening the videos, but if you look to our website, the complete two hour presentation and question and answer by each one of the um, designs that was given on January 30th is there for your full view. And they go into a lot of detail, but each one of them has provided restrooms within the structures, down below the structures, beside the structures, <laughs> course for this to be a successful project uh, for you know the city of San Jose we are going to provide all of those services. To expand on that thank you Christine uh, an important point to be made is that our goal is for this park to have massive numbers of people uh, all the time daytime nighttime and have uh, be activated with rallies with uh, concerts with uh, people and their kids and their grandkids having picnics whatever it might be and the reason I bring all that up is that the uses are what's going to drive the rest, restroom design and the quantity of the restroom. So uh, we intend for this to be a first rate park with proper amenities, including adequate bathrooms. Will cost factors play a role in how the final project will be selected? Did it play a role in the selection of the final three? Uh, the answer is no and no. The, the, no one knows the projected costs of the three finalists other than our internal team. We haven't, we haven't even shared that um, with uh, any of our advisors or with the jury. And the jury will not know the cost of the three. Uh, what we may end up doing is having the jury deliberate without knowing the costs and then have them uh, uh, have further discussion with knowledge about the costs. And keep in mind that the exact costs are not yet known. The three teams did provide cost estimates, but uh, they're, they're not perfect yet. So, uh, but just to be clear, we were consistent from the day we began the competition that the budget was not a criterion. We didn't ask people to, to design to some randomly selected budget that wasn't related to anything. And we sincerely believe, Christine, John and I, and our, our uh, advisors that 
Uh, if something that's more expensive will will be able to be built, um, even though it's more expensive, uh, rather than something that's less expensive and less spectacular. So that we think the key is having a spectacular winner, and we intend to get there. Do you want to take the next one, Christine? Yes. As I'm sure there will be an admission fee to the actual artwork, how do you guarantee that all people of San Jose have the ability to visit? This is, uh, of course, something that we we as I mentioned, inclusivity. We want everyone to. In the process, and it'll be in later phases, there could be a fee to possibly go to the top of it or different levels that'll all be worked out at another time, but there would always be a time of day or days that um, the, the public would be able to see and go to the top without any fee. We're working through all that in the stages. It's, it's been brought up several times, so it's on our radar and no one will be forgotten. Another comment, Breeze of Innovation is hands is the hands down winner in my book because unlike the other two contenders, which are essentially cast in steel in perpetuity, Breeze is, is a blank canvas that can be programmed to render Wonderland, the Nebula, or just about anything else, including messaging welcoming guests as they prepare for touchdown at SJC. Uh, I read this one because it's clearly an opinion. This person loves Breeze of Innovation. Some people's favorite is Breeze, some is Wonderland, and some is Nebula, and we all have our own personal opinions. Uh, ultimately, the jury is going to make the decision, but I, I read that just to uh, reinforce the point that we all have different taste in which of the three is our favorite. What is the height of the SAP Center? I worry about air traffic right over these projects. Uh, the SAP Center is approximately 110 feet tall. All three of our finalists are approximately 200 feet tall. That's not a coincidence. The uh, one engine inoperative uh, and FAA protocols say that the highest structure allowed on Arena Green is approximately 200 feet. So we used 200 feet as the maximum for our competition, e even knowing that probably the ultimate projects can be slightly higher than that. And uh, so we're following the rules like every other uh, entity building things. Uh, if you look around downtown San Jose, uh, every building is constrained in its height. That's why most of our buildings are approximately 250 or 300 feet tall. It has to do with the airport. So we will follow the same safety regulations as any other project. Christine? Do you have a target goal for the number of newly or created jobs for the operations, maintenance, and security of this icon? Nationally from inception, we wanted this project to be something that was embraced not just by the local community, but by a national community and the world at large and bring economic value to the community. So naturally that's going to be a, a job creator. Um, we are working on opportunities and certainly doing our due diligence on the maintenance and operation of that uh, as we speak. You know, we believe that not just jobs on site, but that we're going to be an, a catalyst for economic development uh, everywhere around downtown. Uh, we think it's it, it's a new day and we're gonna be really helpful in that, in that total change of vibe that we're gonna have in downtown, along with these other big projects we talked about earlier, including uh, Google, Deer Dawn Station and others. Will the coloration and patterns change from time to time? Seasonal theme, themes, honoring events, Shark's Victory, for example, Valentine's Pink, July 4th, Red, White, and Blue. Don't want Pepsi ads, et cetera, projected on structure, but city council can change their minds any Tuesday. Uh, a lot of true comments there. Uh, and yes, we certainly visualize this as being a backdrop for all different kinds of projected lighting, whatever they might be, including everything that the questioner mentions here. Uh, also, uh, one or more of the projects might even be able to be used as a giant movie screen. Uh, I can really imagine having thousands of people sitting in the park watching a, a beautiful film out on a, a, a hot summer night. Christine? Yeah, I, I like to say, in addition to that, that we've had a lot of, of real positive um, input on that, that the community really wants that. And so the, again, the lighting and the variety of opportunities that we'll do for our community there is uh, certainly something that, as you can not only see in the three presentations now, but is much more explicit in the uh, full presentations. And again, in the next phases will be determined. I'll remind everyone too that, that we started, the name of our corporation is the San Jose Light Tower Corporation. We were largely inspired by the idea of a 
a fabulous lighted structure that can can be seen from a, a, at least three directions, probably not so much uh, from the west. But uh, lighting matters to us, so we want this to be, thing to be a spectacular light show while it's respectful for all the rules related to biology and the riparian corridor. Go yeah, ahead. And, and certainly adding to that, that you know, this would be something that is totally in harmony with nature, but the lighting part of it. Someone mentioned in one of the earlier ones about flying into San Jose is that, you know, it, it, it's right underneath the flat flight pattern. And that's going to be really a, a spectacle in the positive way for us that everyone will know. That Next, next question, uh, is it very hard to in, envision how each design fits within the existing site and the surrounding environment? For example, street level views from Santa Clara Street view of the relationship to Confluence Point, et cetera. The scale of the urban realm needs to be understood. The carousel is either in or out, and that should be known before a design is approved. If it stays, it needs to be shown, uh, and including how it relates to the design. Uh, all very good points. Uh, we care about ground view. We care about a uh, view from uh, a, a distance away, quarter or, or, or half a mile, depending on uh, what one's location is when viewing uh, our site. The point about the carousel is right on point immediately during phase three, as soon as we have a winning design selected. At that point, the status of the carousel is going to become critical because the juxtaposition of the, the our project uh, and the carousel now becomes really important. So we'll be working on that diligently uh, ver very soon. Um, all, by the way, all three of the projects, if it, if it wasn't obvious in the videos, are located on the northern section of Arena Green West. Christine, you want to take the next one? Sure. For the two, for two of them, it looks like the public can walk up into the structures. Is that correct? Absolutely. And actually, on all three of them, you can. There's different. Uh, different ways of doing that. There is naturally elevators. One of them has uh, several elevators, but there's a, a walkway. One of them goes all the way to the top, but well, actually two of them go all the way to the top. One has a event space at the top, and then uh, one of them is about uh, two thirds of the way up. Now, again, some of this could change in phase three. So one of the questioners says, I completely missed the point on his question. So I'm gonna go back to it because I didn't do that intentionally. It was the comment that Breeze of Innovation is a hands down winner in my book because unlike the other two contenders, which are essentially cast in steel in perpetuity, Breeze is a blank canvas that can be programmed to render pretty much anything, including messaging welcoming guests as they prepare for touchdown at SJC. Uh, I get the point about the blank canvas and I think that's the, the questioner's point. And, uh, whether it's uniquely a blank canvas, I, I can't say for sure because it could be that Nebula Tower could be somewhat of a blank canvas too. To what extent Wonderland could be a blank canvas, I, I'm really not so sure, probably not nearly as much as the other two, but uh, suffice it to say that each of the three has its strengths and its weaknesses, and uh, this is certainly a strength of Breeze of Innovation is that it offers, in essence, the quote-unquote blank canvas to project various things on it. Uh, we've only got a few more minutes. If you have more questions, please send them in right now. I will point out something really important that uh, didn't come up in tonight's questions, but has come up, which is about fundraising. We're going to have a very large amount of money to raise, and our intention is to uh, have a plan that involves very large funders. Uh, any of you who have done capital campaigns know that a, sig a significant, as much as 80% of funding for large projects ends up being raised during what's called the quiet phase. So very soon we're going to be in the mode, as soon as we have a winning design, of going out to very large foundations and very large funders and going out and asking for very important large gifts. Uh, so we've, we've always known that possibly the hardest part of our project will be raising the money, but we are fully committed to doing it and we believe we're going to come up with a spectacular winner which will be embraced by the community and that we ultimately will be successful in raising that money. One more question. Uh, will these be free to visit, for example, riding the elevators for residents? 
Um, I think Christine largely answered that before, but whether whether everything is free all the time or there are aspects of it where there's a some kind of an admission fee, we don't know yet. That will be developed during phase three. We could even up, end up with philanthropists who want to subsidize all of the tickets. Uh, our, our, Santa, our own San Jose Museum of Art for a time, maybe even now, uh, had no admission fee. So we haven't worked out those details yet. We're working on operations and maintenance plans and, and revenue generation now. And uh, we'll know relatively soon, but we don't know the answer yet. Christine, do you want to take one of the last questions? Yes. I love all three, but I'm concerned that Wonderland will be difficult to keep clean due to its proximity to the street, freeway, and approach to San Jose. Um, actually, all three of them are positioned, as Steve said, in about the same location. And they all, in the daytime, have are basically white. There will be different ways of cleaning you know, each one of them, but they're all going to need, you know, maintenance and upkeep and a cleaning process. Once again, we have a winner that will certainly be taken into consideration. I'm going to take one final question and then Christine will wrap up the, the evening. But this question is, are you aware that NASA, the Florida Atlantic University, the scientific magazine physics.org and other scientific institutions have found clear correlations between light pollution and harm to wildlife and humans? What I'll say is that we had a, a very serious professional lighting study done early on. You can all see it on our website. The teams have lighting experts on them, and we will have further lighting studies as we move forward in phase three. So we are paying very careful attention to, to, to lighting and uh, anything that would uh, potentially af affect the flora and the fauna. With that, I'll say thank you and turn it over to my partner, Christine. Thanks, Steve. Uh, first thing I'd like to address here on the PowerPoint is, again, as I said in the beginning, these meetings to the public are really, really critical for us and the awareness that the public has and your input. All of that will be you know, um, documented and taken to the jury as well as taken to the city council. There are many more meetings ahead. You can see them on the screen. We ask that you please um, you know, tell your friends, tell your neighbors, tell your business associates, and turn them on to this, because each time we have one of these meetings, there's new sets of questions, and then there's repeated ones, and we are, again, documenting those and putting the question and answers all on our website. We have one coming up on February 23rd. It's an evening, 6 to 7, then March 22nd, 6 to 7, and March 30th, 5.30 to 6.30. I make note that the March 22nd and the 30th will be after the jury has made their recommendation ranking of first, second, and third. Uh, again, I wanna steer you to the website for a couple of really important reasons, is the two hour presentations to the jury, which were an hour of presentation basically, and then an hour of Q&A are extremely informative. Uh, I think that a lot of questions that you may even be in your mind that you didn't bring up tonight, you will get some really valuable answers to that. Um, the phase two submittals are all there if you wanna go through the all 963 to see how the jury came to these three. I actually personally looked at all those and it's quite rewarding experience to do that. And then the phase two videos are also available, everything on our website. And we welcome your uh, input on things, other things that we could add to that website as we go through these next processes. Another thing that's important to us is accommodating all the different areas that we need to. Anyone with uh, needs, we are translating all of the meetings into Vietnamese as well as Spanish. That will also be on our website. But if there are other needs or disabilities or um, accommodations that you need, please let us know. Steve's uh, email is right here and he's always available on his phone. Hard working Steve, you know, he's, he's not gonna get any rest until we crack the champagne on this place. Um, the recordings for all these community meetings, including the subtitles and the translations, as I mentioned, are on the website. And I, 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 I keep repeating this, but your, your enthusiasm, your questions, your input is what's going to help us make this successful because this is much bigger process and project.
than it is just Steve, John, and our and you know the small group that we have around us. It's a large group that we have uh, invested in and has vested in us. So please be a part of that. And again, Steve has just been an amazing executive director. He's uh, there for you in anything that you want to ask and get information to. And if he can't answer it or we can't answer it, then we'll get back to you. I appreciate you giving us your time tonight. Certainly there's my famous words that um, at the uh, confluence of two rivers lies the world's next iconic landmark. The question is, what will it be? We just want that to be what San Jose, its citizens and Silicon Valley is very proud of. So thank you for joining us this evening.